Hello, my name is Fraser Simons. This is my channel, Springboard Thought. Today I'm doing the last weekly roundup for November, which I think has worked out pretty well so far. I will probably do a monthly wrap up as well. I think it would be interesting to contrast them. And then if that doesn't work out, then maybe we'll just stick with weekly reads and go from there. This week was pretty decent. I read 14 books, although more like 13 books-ish because the first one was a DNF. It is um, on the Governor General Fiction nominations. I don't believe it won. It's Homewaltz by G.A. Uh, Grisenweight. And this is about a boy who is living in a town as an indigenous person where much of the town is mixed. And so he's encountering a lot of racism as there are all of them. He has two friends, also indigenous. They're younger, I think just hitting puberty. And it takes place in Canada. I didn't finish it not because it was uh, not well written. I thought it was actually very compelling in its voice. It has a very good flow uh, right off the bat, actually. The characters are very distinctive. The town is very well rendered but I just found myself in a place where I didn't want to be reading about adolescent boys because the main stakes of the story, which takes a while to set up, I read a third of it at 100 pages out of 300-ish, and um, the stakes is essentially these boys who have the typical adolescent dynamics where they're um, sort of locker rooming each other. They sort of pick on each other. Uh, it's very like, heteronormative pack dynamics between male type situation and they want to go to a party on the weekend and drink and see what happens basically and none of that at all is appealing to me but I wanted to interact it, uh, with it at least and see if it is something that would kind of get its hooks in me while I was going but I just in a way that's sort of my adolescence around that age that I just have a very like visceral reaction to where I just don't like reading about that kind of stuff especially uh, drinking especially parties especially um, dynamics between boys like that so then on audio I read the book of magic which is the practical magic book too but there is prequels as well so it's actually the fourth book overall in that series and I've read them all. The only thing that sort of makes sense is the last book published is the first book overall and the one that originates the curse in this family um, and the rest of the books chart this curse as it makes its ranks and essentially savages the family in different ways. The curse is put down is kind of a Spoiler, so I won't make it explicit why it actually happens, but the reason why it is inflicted doesn't matter so much as the fact that the Owens family, for whatever reason, cannot love somebody else. And if they do, then the curse comes into effect and something terrible will happen to them. And so there's different dynamics as the generations goes by where they're trying to... <laughs> Um, shelter their kids in some ways or be explicit about it. They try all these different ways of trying to circumnavigate it um, to varying degrees of effect and it is just so good in its interplay of uh, tragedy and comedy. All of the books are very well written and this is the sort of um, tie in the bow. It's, it ostensibly concludes all of it which I'm sad about um, but as I was reading them, I was trying to be very aware of what I really liked about this because it kind of scratched an itch that I didn't know was there. And I think what it is is that the verisimilitude that all of the characters are steeped in, because it is very much slice of life with stakes that are appropriate to, you know, the teenagers or the grandmothers or whomever is involved in the Owens family um, lens at that particular moment, um, except for when the stakes get rapidly elevated because of the curse. 
but even that slice of life aspect is sort of augmented because when she talks about um, the way magic is integrated into the fiction is also sort of mundane and fits into the verisimilitude. So for instance, one of the girls runs away and in order to make the other girl call home because she's not answering her phone and whatnot, one of the characters decides to bake a pie in order to make her homesick and call home, which works. And so there's the sort of grounding in this like folkloric aspect of um, witchiness, of, of magic, but also it also sort of makes sense culturally at a level that baking a homemade apple pie with the main ingredient being, you know, the love and the thoughts that you're putting into the person would elicit that kind of behavior in the real world. So it's just a sort of, yeah, mundane realism packed into it. And then the coupling of it with like ingrained cultural roots. And she will mention specific fiction and specific um, things alluded to within other fiction, like uh, popularized books of magic, for instance, and stuff like that. So she's just very smart about how she goes about world building because it's not hard world building. There isn't like, she sometimes puts down like specific laws of what magic can and cannot do, of course, but most of the time when she's world building, she's soft world building, yet it has roots in culture. So she doesn't have to like elucidate on them. They just all seem like they make sense. And then you also couple that with coming of age with a little bit of romance, a little bit of like witchy uh, danger stuff happening with like spells and counter spells and then it goes all the way back to the roots of um original witches or whatever in the first prequel book so it becomes like dynastic it becomes very like dynamic it elucidates more about all of the characters pretty much no matter what trajectory you go on for all four books and i think that's really interesting and well executed. I ended up giving this four stars and uh, it's not my favorite one. The favorite one I think is the Rules of Magic which was the third last published book. <laughs> it's the first prequel to Practical Magic and the second book overall. <laughs> Next I read The Jasmine Throne Burning Kingdoms by Tasha Suri. This is about a woman who's trying to steal a throne and a sort of, um, not rakes or riches, but a maid who has a lot more potential and realizes it. So there's sort of, you know, flip a coin and they're the opposites ostensibly, yet they come together in specific ways. It's a YA fantasy. It's not Western centric, which I liked a lot. Um, People of Color as characters, written by a person of color. Um, it was uh, queer. The romance was quite good, I thought. Um, but it also, lately I've been reading a lot of young adult and it's slowly sort of been alienating me because as I read uh, literary fiction and other stuff, I just find that that's where I mostly want to be. Uh, in terms of diction, prose, um, complexity, and stuff like that. And so while I enjoy this stuff, I'm enjoying it less and less. I thought it was fine and it was well executed, but I'm slowly going to be phasing young adult reading probably out of my life um, much more so. Next, I read uh, Diana, the Unseen Ones, short stories by Norma Dunning who's Canadian and uh, works at the university north of uh, where I am. Well, three and a half hours north of where I am in Edmonton. This was a great set of short stories. I rated it four out of five stars. I have a video coming on it. Um, it is unusual, interesting, unique, well-written, but uh, in a sort of precise and concise or economical type of way. It wasn't particularly evocative or big on description, 
but the character work and the actual themes that were being uh, used were great. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And like I said, there's a video coming soon. I then read the third book in The uh, Girl Called Echo by Katharina Vermette. I gave this four stars. This continues to be pretty great. The last book is on hold at the library and is going to be coming at some point. It's another shorty graphic novel, 40 pages, 47 pages, something like that. It continues with the story of how the Métis was displaced and what happened to Louis Riel and stuff like that. So if you already know that stuff, maybe it won't surprise you. But there is a list uh, at the end with historical accuracy points. It obviously can encapsulate everything and it is trying to tell the story of Echo as well as that. I think it's well balanced. It is communicating good things about uh, Echo, her imagination and her experience with consuming the content of what happened to her people previously and sort of how it emotionally uh, affects her and probably in some ways traumatizes her. Um, it, it's just a compelling read. I definitely recommend it. I can see why it is recommended and um, seems like it's geared towards being put into classrooms, I'm guessing, or at least libraries in schools. Next, I read Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe by Benjamin uh, Alary Sainz. Hopefully I pronounced that right. Three stars. This was fine. It seemed a little bit uh, melodramatic in the sense of the dialogue in particular. Um, it sort of felt like the writer felt as though um, dramatic characters need to be dramatic all of the time <laughs> with no sort of lull. He, the main characters go from zero to 100 all of the time. They either feel nothing or feel too much. There's a slow burn romance uh, with the two uh, queer characters. It's pretty intersectional. It explores some class divide stuff. It was fairly well written, but um, I didn't connect too much with it just because of that sort of need to in constantly be injecting drama of some kind. There was, felt like there was no place to breathe, um, but it did have a very great ending and a very great beginning, I thought. It just felt a little bit padded in the middle. And because it felt padded, maybe that's why he kept injecting the drama. Next, I read Bluettes by Maggie Nelson. This was a three-star read for me as well. Um, this was a, similarly a book that sort of ran out of steam around the middle and concluded very well and began very well. Some of the points are very good. It's somewhat unconventional in that it's just a list uh, of points so some of them you'll kind of agree with and the points tie together a larger narrative threads of uh, what is happening probably because the simple nature of her just wanting to be obsessed with the color blue and try to articulate what it is about that um, probably would have left steam a little bit but Overall, it worked for me. I liked it. This was a super hyped up book for me though, so it was always probably never going to be a five star read just because I had big expectations for it. But I, I mean, I think to some degree the fact that it was successful when it is merely, or not merely, but because it is a list of things and because not all of these things are going to resonate with you or not, um, and because it, it vacillates between these different threads or just diversions into the colors. Uh, I don't see how everything could resonate with me, and it didn't. Then I read Nishka by Jordan Abel. This book is incredible. If you pick any of these books to read, please pick Nishka. Uh, five star read, mixed media. He's expressing his indigeneity through a very unconventional format. There's a transcript of his presentation about his identity and then there is another transcript near the end where we learn that the book is a essentially a completion of a thesis project and it kind of weaves together all of the things that are in the book. There is 
uh, his father's artwork that's indigenous and very iconic in Canada. If you've been nearly anywhere in Canada for in terms of like landmark museums or um, historical stuff to do with indigenous people, you've probably seen his artwork. And um, so there's these pieces with text and sometimes there's photographs that are overlaid within the artwork and sometimes the text overrides it, sometimes the image overrides it, and it's all him trying to sort of explain a fractured identity and um, his relationship with his father, his relationship with these specific texts, because some of the text that is um, being injected into it is colonial versions of uh, chronicling indig indigeneity. So it's masterful, it's perfect, uh, it sort of moves like you're in a museum looking at gallery pieces with those little like placards next to it that you know give little notes on how to um, interpret the piece or whatever, except the notes are basically journal entries of his that um, contextualize the actual image. It's incredible, it'll definitely be in my you know top 10 or 20 or whatever I choose to do for the end of the year. Next I read The Plotters by Unsu Kim. This is a three star read. I thought it was pretty great, uh, but it is mired somewhat in verisimilitude, which simultaneously made it more interesting and unconventional for the genre, and also uninteresting, uninteresting, because it's like preoccupied with making him so human in these uh, small moments of like cowardice with relating to a specific person that he's met or like a sub life that he has made to get close to a specific target but then has to abort um, and just like yeah like slice of life things that are happening when it is sort of billed as a um, you know like a genre fiction thriller type book uh, about a syndicated killer who is just told who to kill and he kills them. And so it's not, it doesn't follow the typical trajectory of what you would think when you read that. And like I said, both good and bad, but it definitely delivers on the ingrained premise that occurs when you actually read the text in the beginning. And so I think it's a successful book and it was enjoyable in the end. Next, I read The Tragedy of the Worker towards the Proletaricine. The Salvage Collective did this. This is a verso book, of course. It is coached in heavy academic language again, which I think is very ironic because who is this book for if not the worker? It starts out chronicling the different tragedies of the worker and then it posits something that is not really obtainable. It's very like nebulous in its goals um, and it essentially sort of reads like we're probably going to have to just wait for capitalism to destroy everything and then salvage what we can um, basically and I'm like yeah no shit basically right like is that a progressive opinion? Probably not. Um, it does articulate some very interesting things from time to time as it is identifying different systemic issues with capitalism. If you're ingrained and know about the subject already, I doubt anything would be revelatory to you. And it does read like somebody is not googling thesaurus words, but unnecessarily injecting academic verbiage and language and diction into every aspect of the text, including sentence structure, paragraph structure, etc., for no real reason. It is obviously useful as jargon as like a shorthand, but it doesn't actually feel like it needs to define anything. It often uh, makes nouns, verbs, and it also just feels pretentious, uh, basically. I gave it three stars. I thought it was fine. In terms of what the mission statement is, it probably delivered it. it. Are a lot of people going to be consuming this? Obviously not. It's not accessible to most people, even though it is a low price point. So it's a strange communication to people, I think. 
Next I read uh, Felix Ever After by Kaysen Callender. This was a huge book last year. Um, this was YA. It is um, queer. It's very good, I think, at exploring uh, queer characters in a humanist way that allows them to have flaws and to mess up and to see them um, try to do better and not just be like a monolithic thing presented to the white heteronormative society uh, as people that are either uh, bleeding and need to be seen as people and not dehumanized or um, completely almost other in its perfection of queerdom or its expression of queerdom. So I really like that. It's very accessible language. Um, it's contemporary. It's a little bit above commercial fiction in writing. The narrator for the audiobook was quite good. The setup doesn't sound enticing, but I urge you to pick it up anyway. Essentially, Felix has been outed in a very public way. I won't go into it. And all of the friend groups are generally queer in some way uh, and with varying degrees of privilege, which Felix does not have. The best friend in the story is the opposite of Felix, where they um, he knows exactly what his um, queer self is. It's already realized. He's not really questioning. He uh, is very privileged. He's very rich and all of those things Felix is not. Uh, Felix is trans, a person of color, and questioning different aspects of identity, and I think pronouns as well, I believe. And the plot is that Felix will get back at the person who has outed them. So trying to kind of like discern who did it, um, not in a very Sherlocky way, but it is definitely a B plot that is happening. And then everybody's sort of interactions with Felix, how it elucidates different aspects of uh, queerdom, how they interact with trans people from transphobia to inclusion. And uh, then, you know, the B plot is almost beside the point, but does wrap things up quite nicely. And so Felix catfishing different people, he has a very specific suspect in mind, is not something enticing that I would go for initially. That's just not something I want to read about. But it is surprisingly good, handles it well, and like I said, is incredibly intersectional about what it's attempting to discover and um, more investigate than to fully um, sort of capture and put a, a period at the end with. Next I read I'm Afraid of Men by Vivek uh, Shreya. This was fantastic. I gave it five stars. It's a 96 page short little memoir about uh, her life experience and I didn't even know she was Albertan but apparently she is. And uh, it chronicles a life with a male partner uh, transitioning a lot of stuff actually is covered in just the 96 pages. The audiobook is fantastic. She narrates it herself. Um, I personally found it very impactful. I thought it had some really good uh, ruminations on it and I thought that overall the intersections of which she approaches the performance of uh, male gender in particular um, is humanist and allowing a very feminist perspective into uh, her life, which, I mean, she's been through so much with the transition and all these other things that I found that it was just very um, moving, like I said. Next, I read The Years by Annie Arnaud. Uh, I gave this five stars. This is unlike anything that I've read before. It is um, like a memoir type thing, but I can see why it was originally uh, classified as fiction, because essentially she has collected, you know, thousands of notes and then goes into the so, like Anthropocene of culture and charts everything, but it becomes like a time capsule in which she includes herself. So 
the impressions are more about like what was happening with culture and she includes herself there so it's like sometimes she will delineate um, between her lived experience and her specific memories but other times it'll be like the movements of culture as if it's like a tide coming in on the beach some of it remains as sediment but overall and it's very rhythmic things are coming in and going um it's cyclic it's displaying the nature of humanity and uh time and history in particular it shows just how much um the patterns of culture continue to repeat and how scary that is but also how like interesting it is and how um memory is formed and shaped it was absolutely fantastic and then the last book that i consumed was via audio as well a court of wings and ruin uh which is the third book in that series by sarah j mass this is the weakest book so far i think it was a two and a half stars where i generously rounded up some things are handled quite well but others feel like it's just drama being uh, injected for no real reason or organic reason some things about it that worked though is she's surprisingly good at action scenes and making sort of innocuous details come together and the ending is where it really sort of where it was like leading to a really cool point robs the tension of the story completely and also feels unearned because it somehow hasn't built up to the ending that made sense it felt like it wanted to just inject a twist basically and it, some aspects of it worked but it was also so overwrought after that um, central tension ending that i began to <laughs> not really care and not really want to be present in the fiction any longer it was way past the point of ending and like return of the king kind of way so i don't know i think i still will consume the next book but um mostly just because it wraps up so much stuff that i'm not even sure what the next book will be about so it could definitely well be that i start the next book and it ends up being a dnf quite quick because it's 26 hours in an audiobook but who knows, it also could equally have reflected on the um, this book and the ending that was strange and try to chart something interesting again, who knows. In terms of what I am reading right now, I'm reading Midnight's Children and I'm actually really enjoying it. I've been kind of put off by this book for a while because a lot of people on Goodreads that I'm friends with or follow or whatever didn't really enjoy it. And it seems like a book where you have to really click with the voice in order to get it and like it. And I do, so it definitely is another book actually where it's hard to pick out what details are important and which ones are just innocuous because the conceit of it is that he can potentially, or at least ostensibly, um, be in the different minds of all of the people in India. He was born at midnight at a specific hour when um, India was like birthed as a country. And so I really like the idea of his growth being parallel to the actual country and him, I don't know, somehow having this sort of like fantasy element injected where he can uh, be in the minds of different people. And it's not, I thought at first it would be um, he could enter the minds of um, all the people born that day or something but it seems to be anyone and like tourists at different locations you can sort of be anywhere do anything as long as um, those people are uh, thinking those particular uh, thoughts he can't like elicit them telepathy type thing I guess if it's even happening who knows um, I'm about 30% in there's a very rapid fire sort of cadence to this it is very interesting I like how much detail and how much description and what kind of um, verbs he uses for uh, description it's kind of wild that it takes 25% of the book for him to like be born 
uh, it's a very unusual voice and uh, more so even perspective like where is he in time that he's able to look at things in this way uh, and that thought sort of makes me more interested in the story. And then I'm also, uh, I didn't bring it down it looks like, but I'm also about 50% done with Cavalier and Clay and I'm quite enjoying that as well. It has some real world applications uh, or parallels to the comic industry, which I only kind of know in passing. Um, so it's kind of interesting because it will spark a memory of uh, my dad talking about this specific thing in Golden Age uh, history for comics or like certain elements of different creators or controversies and things like that and so it's been an interesting experience it's like a dialogue with different memories that I have as a kid paralleling um, their sort of come up into the Golden Age of comics so it's been cool. And that's it. That's my last weekly reads of November. Let me know what you've been reading, what you've been enjoying, what you dislike, and I will see you next video.